Hi everyone, I'm Jeannie Maxwell. I'm a curator at ACME and welcome to today's In Conversation about the bawdy and brilliant Hulu series, The Great. Uh, I'm joined today by Tony McNamara and Sharon Long to discuss the series overall with a kind of specific focus on the incredible costumes that we're currently showing in Story of the Moving Image, our permanent free exhibition. Um, for anyone who isn't familiar with uh, the wonderful Tony McNamara, he has worked in his career as in a wide variety of roles from production to direction to writing across screen stage, uh, including both film and television. From his directorial de debut with Rage at Placid Lake, from writing iconic Australian soaps like Secret Life of Us, Love My Way and Puberty Blues, Magnamara then went on to write and direct The Favourite uh, and most recently The Great, uh, which has just been renewed for its third season. Uh, like I said, we're also joined by award-winning costume designer Sharon Long, who designed the remarkable opulent gowns, coats and furs that we see across season two and we'll see again in season three. Tony, how are you doing? Um, I'm very well, thanks. I'll just say one thing. I didn't direct the favourite. That was the uh, genius of Yorgos Lanthimos, but I, uh, I did I'm write sorry. it. I'm sorry. That's good. No, no, no. <laughs> I can't take credit for that. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, thank you. It's nice to be here. <laughs> I just realised I um, should also acknowledge that I'm broadcasting from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and to pay my respects to their elders past and present and just to acknowledge that ACME is on stolen land and that sovereignty was never ceded. Um, apologies for that error. Um, I think there's That's such a right. kind of... Uh, I just, uh, I couldn't face him if I... Uh, oh, absolutely I, not. <laughs> I, I took credit for that. All him. Um, I think there's kind of such an interesting relationship between those two um, kind of pieces of media and this tone that develops from the stage play of The Great then through to The Favourite and then through to the series that I kind of... It's hard not to see your hand everywhere, I guess. Uh, uh. <laughs> Um, um, yeah. So I watched a few, I watched and read quite a few interviews with you about your work in the lead up to this event. And a really common question that I see is interviewers asking you about what draws you to period dramas. Um, and the answer that you've given that I find quite exciting is this idea of scale, the kind of opulence, um, kind of opulence and extravagance of of period dramas and how much you can do kind of creatively in that space. Um, I'm really interested to hear how that scale or I guess your relationship to it differs when writing for film, TV or for um, stage. Um, well, it's sort of interesting because, uh, yeah, I love the scale of it and I love the stakes that you get in something like a court because it's very life or death in a personal sense and it's very broad in a political sense. Um, so, and also a period frees you from contemporary um, morality in a lot of ways. So <laughs> I, I kind of like the world it gives you. Um, well, it, it depends. I mean, the scale, in a strange way, the scale of the great is bigger than the scale of the favourite, um, even though it's a movie. You know, the favourite was a movie that, uh, that we sort of always saw as like not quite a chamber piece, but it was very court-based um, you know, we shot it in one place. I think we were 36 days and we were 30 days in, in one palace. Um, so it was always a small scale and you you imagined the rest of the world. Whereas I think with The Great, um, we get to, we're sort of a bit 70, 30, you know, we get our palace drama, but we also get to go and expand the palette and go to the front or and, and just kind of, I think the good thing about the, the thing we all like doing on the show is kind of finding a big scale event. You know, we like event in the show. I like writing for event. And um, I think it, it gives our designers, you know, some something to play with. And, um, and it just gives the show a sense of, um, you know, beauty and scale and cinematicness within a TV frame, I suppose. Uh, you mentioned kind of that idea of escaping from contemporary morality. Um, 
into the iniquities of a period <laughs> drama. Um, it kind of seems to me that that's uh, that idea of like writing and enjoying immoral characters is kind of a trend in TV at the moment, you know, with the success of shows like The Great, but also Succession, which kind of also explores uh, the lives of the wealthy and debauched <laughs> in yeah. kind of a different setting. Um, why, why do you think that is? Why do you think people like to get that kind of look into this? Uh, I think we are, I, you know, I think human beings are flawed and they know they're flawed and we live in a culture that's pretty intolerant of imperfection and pretty cancelly of imperfection um, or of mistakes. And I think um, I think it's something to do with that. I think it's a it's our society is pretty um, well you know, messed up on a lot of levels politically and etc. But I think there's something in just the flawed characters and you see their humanity behind their mistakes because I think there's something in the way we interact in a social media sense and in a media sense that sort of takes the humanity out of humans and and so I think there's a there's a joy in kind of going oh look how fun how people actually are I recognize it and you know what it's sort of fun to watch because it's a cathartic thing we don't get to have that in our lives anymore um it was even like puberty blues I think there was a sense amongst it was a, we, we thought it'd be a nostalgia piece for people of my generation but it was a you know I had a high school daughter at the time it was a massive hit amongst high school kids and one of the things about it they liked was this sense of freedom that kids had back then and this sense of um, looseness and this sense of ex exploration that was possible um, that they all found really kind of cathartic and interesting and amazing to them that parents didn't helicopter them. You know, the parents in the 70s went, yeah, what is it Saturday morning? See you Sunday night. You know, um, and so I think I think it's a similar thing to that. There's an escapism to it that people kind of dig. I think that makes sense. That was certainly something I really uh, noticed with Peter's characterization in season two, that he went from this kind of totally psychopathic um, kind of camp wild uh, yeah. murder man to, you know, the birth of Paul who brings out this, equally sort of deranged but clearly very sensitive and very real side of him yeah um, I think that's yeah he had a he has a sort of weird humanity to him and his own own logic yeah. to it <laughs> um you've kind of described your writing approach as very character driven but I know you um also work very closely kind of with your team and with your actors kind of wonder how much of those sort of um fluctuations, I guess, in characterization are driven by the actors as well? I think the, not so much the act. I mean, the actors in the sense that I don't write all the show before we start. I write about half of it. And then I, I, do, I do kind of watch what they're doing a lot and who's sparking with who and what's interesting. And uh, so I do, in that sense, they do... Um, what they do on set and how the scenes are playing. And if we see a scene like, I think there wasn't much of Doug and Nick together last year at the start in the plotting and then Velamentov and Peter. And then they just did this great scene together um, at one point. And then, so I went, oh, that's some, it's, it's great to have those two together. So we just find story that puts them together. Um, because also they remind you of their characters are in, when they're up and running, you go, oh, yeah, of course they'd have, an, have a complicated relationship. So, so, yeah, I do do that. I do watch and react to what I'm seeing a, a bit, yeah. Do you think that um, kind of, I guess, like evolving sort of approach to character writing is something that came from your background with kind of, I guess, iconic soap operas? I guess so. I mean... I think, um, yeah, I mean, I guess so. I mean, that's where I sort of learnt my trade, so to speak, um, particularly on things like uh, Tangle or something, you know, or I Love My Way, particularly on a Tangle and Puberty Blues where I was more involved in production, the, you know, in the sort of that more heavily involved. Um, it was something I kind of learnt and I liked and 
Um, and also I love acting because I come from theatre, really. I spend a lot of time with actors, so I'm not um, afraid of actors and I, I kind of love actors. But I also think it's a, it's a, I think it's a thing you learn, like, if you walk into our world, like our world of the show, very quickly you're like you're working with incredibly talented people not and not just the actors so it's even that I don't do it all because I listen to like what Sharon or Fran or Louise our heads of department have ideas and have feed into the process of um of of script you know in kind of like they research things and they'll come in and they'll just, we'll just talk about interesting things that they know about the era or, um, and even just responding to the initial scripts or the scene breakdowns, there's a kind of slight interplay of, it's not just like, here it is, go do it. There is a conversation about what do you guys think and um, what ideas and we are, and often that's fed back into the storytelling because it's, because it just enriches it in a way that I could that I couldn't because I don't know these things. It's but but everyone understands the tone of the show and and he sort of buys into what it is and and so it, it is like a circular thing, which is why I don't just land all ten scripts and go here it is, uh, which makes it harder on everyone because they're waiting for the story and they're waiting for scripts and production wise it's a it's a it's a tougher road that we choose, but I think it's in the end a richer product because of it. Um, you kind of mentioned the tone of the show, and I know you've spoken previously about um, kind of maybe some prejudices you ha you held against period dramas before beginning to write them yourself. Um, how did, can you talk me through kind of the early stages of conceiving something like The Great, which does have such a unique voice? I think originally when it was a play, I started writing it as a straight period thing, and I was a bit bored, which might have been the genre or it might have been just I was incapable of actually writing it well. Um, so I think in the end I just went, oh, well, what? I'd never written a period thing before. I'd written a four or five contemporary plays, but I didn't want to write a contemporary play. I was sort of sick of them. Um, so it took me a while. It took me six months or so. I think I wrote a draft or two, and then I just went, oh, well, I would hate this play. So... Um, then I was like, what would make me like it? And I thought, oh, I, I would like it if the language felt contemporary, but still felt true. And that was really the key. Once I sort of found the language, I sort of understood how to do it, do the play, I suppose. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I wonder if uh, there were kind of specific moments um, kind of during uh, the development, uh, maybe specifically of season one, but also of season two, where, you know, an actor or another member of the production team designer kind of came to you with an idea that ended up kind of shifting or cementing something significant about the, about the show. Oh, gosh. I mean, probably a lot between them and the, um, my tiny, my little writer's room, there would have been a lot. Um, I'm trying to think. I mean, even, and well, even ideas like the idea of Peter, which is in the first season, where we first see what a, not first see, but Peter, um, this idea that he'd outlawed beards. Um, I didn't know that. And I think it was a mixture of either Marion McGowan telling me that or, or Louise, hair and makeup, telling me that. But that became a very, great episode, a very emblematic thing, a very stupid thing. So it was stupid. It was funny. It also was freaking dangerous in the end. So that was a, that was a kind of great way for us to plant our absurdist flag in an episode two, I think it was. Um, but I think those kind of things happen a lot on the show, you know, I think. Um, and also it's like, um, well, last year with The Whale, um, I think that that had a lot of iterations of, which is like, you know, I had an idea and I, I can't even remember how it began of doing a fantasy sequence and it wasn't the whale to begin with, it was something else. And then Fran had an idea and I had another, idea. you know, it just becomes a back and forth, you know. And even um, 
you know, even the baby shower was probably a smaller thing until Sharon had the idea of what that could look like, you know. Um, and the feel of that became different because of what it, what the costumes could look like, you know. So I think um, I think those things happen all the time in the show, which is why TV, why I love TV so much, because it is a sense of um, even you, you know, you're the show run, you're the showrunner, but you're very aware of everyone on board this thing and I think we're lucky in our show that everyone's trying to make a great show and we're all the same sort of artists that we're all slightly workaholics who push ourselves yeah in the show to the to the limit and try and get as much out of it as we can you know probably to the exhaustion of all of us but <laughs> but that's the way we do it. Uh, I feel like that's quite a natural point to sort of introduce Sharon and bring her into the conversation a little bit more. Um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to how your sort of working relationship began um, at the beginning of season two. Is that for me to answer? <laughs> Both of you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <You're free. laughs> Well, well, I can start. I can just say, well, this is how this is how Sharon we found Sharon. Basically, Holly, who'd done the pilot, I I rang her and I said, I I just want a really great season two. You know, costume's so important to us. It's so important to Al and me and Marion. And who do you think could do, you know who's super talented that we could get? And she said, you should talk to Sharon. And so we did. And now here's Sharon to remark on that a bit. <laughs> yes, that's true. I, I owe Holly. <laughs> <laughs> I need to see her. Yes, that's, I mean, that you, I mean, you'd already established a kind of wor a working relationship with the HODs where you kind of have a tone meeting. So, you know, that's, that's, that's the initial point of, of talking about um, the costumes, the sets and the hair as a, as a whole not as individuals really, individual areas. Um, so I joined those tone meetings. <laughs> so the I'm beginning just, of the relationship. <laughs> I'm really interested to hear kind of what drew you to this project uh, overall. Um, fantastic scripts, really good actors, really fun. And I don't know, endless possibilities, I think. I mean, there is endless possibilities. That's that's why um, there wasn't much um, conflict in in doing another season because the, the, there's it's not more of the same. It's just more. There's more to do. There's more ideas. Yeah, I mean, when you put it like that, it sounds pretty impossible <laughs> to resist. It's a lot of upside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, it is all positives, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, going back to the baby shower, because you kind of mentioned that was a uh, maybe a sequence that was that developed almost in response to costuming opportunities. Could you kind of talk me through your approach to to that sequence? And what I, I think it was a kind of it was it was Lou and uh, myself and Fran all talking about um, with modern baby showers really and the kind of what we could do, I mean, it was an episode we didn't want to it to cost masses and masses of money for for a party that didn't take up much of the um, airtime. But it's so we were trying to we were throwing ideas in as a group of three to kind of color wise, so that we kept a certain palette, um, and we made it a fancy dress it it was a, a good opportunity I mean we're all in lockdown it was quite a fun thing to do and <laughs> um, I think I think most of the actors really liked it. it's the first party they'd gone to for ages so they were really yeah. really enjoyed it when they got on set um so it was just yeah it was a kind of really joyful you know uh, event to do and, and that I think that's expressed in the costumes and the hair and so, I mean some of the wigs were pretty monumental um yeah it was a lovely it was a lovely th I mean everything else was was going along at the same time it was almost like it was our our little aside we had a kind of um 
we had a, a, on Fridays, my, the whole team started to make things. They were making hats and, you know, it was a sort of in-house sort of project, <laughs> if you like. <laughs> they were being developed, the Fabergé egg and, you know, the big flower and things like that. Um, and I think, do you ask, no, go ahead. No, go, please, go. No, please, please. <laughs> no, I was going to say that, um, I, I mean, uh, the actors, uh, Nick in particular, really pushed actually for, you know, the extravagance um, of that particular scene. He was very game. You mentioned earlier um, that working with this cast in particular, you were kind of blessed with the opportunity to work with actors who really um, uh, knew what to do with a big costume. Yes. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could kind of speak a little bit more uh, to that as we were kind of before the interview, particularly around working with Gillian Anderson and her remarkably structured gown. No, I, do, I think or I'm really, really lucky that all, all the cast uh, are very collaborative. They all um, enjoy wearing the costumes and they kind of make them come alive, actually. So the, the fittings are actually a, a very... Um, positive experience which is you know it's usually un that's quite unusual to, <laughs> them, to be positive so that and, the, and there's a certain amount of uh input and because they're so good with their costumes it means we can push them further so Nick wearing um feathers on his head that are kind of you know two foot high wasn't a problem for Nick therefore it's not a problem and then then things can be more extreme and he can look fantastic. Gillian had a sort of giant feather dish on her head and very wide panniers and nobody thought she'd get out of the carriage and uh, one of my assistants practiced and couldn't get out of the carriage and Gillian just went I saw sorry I just don't see the problem let me go and rehearse with my dress on and my hat and I'll come out of the carriage and she just did because she, she liked the costume and she wanted yeah, to love the so, costumes yeah and so and she made and she just made it work and the sideways going through door things yeah, it's funny. looked great and that was Gillian yeah. that wasn't um that was a sort of you know and uh, the same with kind of Elle's dresses filling with air because she makes that happen and then it looks wonderful on screen because she you know she swooshes and can use her skirts properly and you know, there's, there has no problem with a, a high heel, a long dress, a train. That's that's pretty impressive. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose um, it occurs to me that Elle Fanning in particular has quite a bit of editorial experience kind of working as a model as well as yeah, she an actor, does, which yeah. I imagine <laughs> would help. Um, I wonder, you know, despite the kind of... Um, opulent and gloriously ahistorical approach you've taken to some of the kind of patterns um, and fabrics, uh, you do have these sort of more traditional, somewhat more traditional um, 18th century silhouettes that were not designed to be marched around in <laughs> those gowns. Um, I was wondering kind of how you approached adapting uh, those silhouettes and the underpinnings and corsetry as well for kind of long days on set and for characters who, rather than sitting pretty in courtrooms, march around handing out macaroons on battlefields. Um, well, I mean, I think we try and make them as light as possible and as comfortable as possible. I mean, that's the, you know, that's a name. I mean, it doesn't, it, sometimes they just are uncomfortable. To, it's more the corsets, to be honest, than, yeah. than the um, skirts. Um, and we take them, you know, if the people can't cope with them for the whole day, we take them off at points to make it easier. But, you know, I think everybody, I think everyone accepts that that is the period and to take that away, it, it just wouldn't be the same. I don't know, it just wouldn't be the, the same. The, the whole, the fact that they are in these massive dresses and walking around as if they're in 20th century clothing is part of the charm really the fact that they can move their arms and and their skirts bounce and I, I just think that's part of it that's part of what makes it um I don't know just a really interesting piece 
Uh, were there particular uh, kind of moments or costumes that you worked, that you and Tony kind of worked more closely on to kind of achieve a specific visual impact or a kind of that narrative coronation moment? Dress, the coronation dress. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was going to say that and the owl when she's, you know, does the cocaine and has her belly out, which is more yeah. how you, you, <laughs> yeah. you, you solved that so brilliantly. Yeah, the coronation was like, and it's a bit of a three-way because Al was involved as well. Yeah. Um, but it was a hard one because we were trying to like, I can't remember exactly, Sharon, but it was like I was like, it's got to be, because I, I, you know, I'm usually led and then I'll, you know, but I think we all wanted a sort of what is it and can it look like it could be on a Gucci catwalk now, but yeah, also just, fit our show and not like feel like we're doing that. So it's like a ridiculous brief. Um, and, but that was our sort of back and forth, but we had a fair bit of back and forth about it, I think. Yeah, we did. Because you, you'd scripted the... Some, a traditional kind of something that would appeal to the Russian people, which is basically a sarafan, which is a, like a giant smock, which is yeah. really to a contemporary yeah. art very attractive. So it was sort of, uh, and there was, and the art department had a drawing, didn't they, of a little old lady? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and. Um, and it was, yeah, super yeah, difficult. Yeah, it was a kind of comp And also Elle's character's pregnant. So it was all, all yeah. these sort, sort of thrown in. And it was the very, game. almost the first, one of the first things of that season in a way. So it was very, um, we were pressed for time and it was COVID and Sharon couldn't get any fabrics because they closed all question. their houses. Especially and it was this constant. And because it was in story, it was important that it be rushed, but we were trying to actually match up to this little drawing in a book and make it also the moment we knew that in a way it had to be, which was stunning. Um, but also we had an old woman in a smock as our template, <laughs> template oh, no. picture, as well as me going, but Gucci on a catwalk now. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure her, Sharon's head was exploding. And the, but... and the headdress to the crown, and then she has her headdress, and then she takes it off, and then she That's has right. <laughs> And also she was supposed to kneel. Remember she was supposed to kneel? Yeah. And we were and like, okay, this is cool. Then she yeah. couldn't kneel and like, it's bonkers. Yeah. No, it was really crazy. And all the and the people who made both the crown and the headdress, we couldn't see them because it was locked down and COVID. Yeah. So I, so I was like looking at, I mean, the first sight of the headdress was in a wheelbarrow in somebody's garden because... <laughs> The man who, the, the girl who designed the pieces and the man who built it as a headdress were our neighbours, but they weren't allowed to meet inside a house. So they were meeting in his back garden and then sending me the photographs. It's just crazy. But it happened. It's amazing. Yeah. And then the, and then the crown was, uh, the crown arrived and it was, uh, the first crown was circular. It wasn't head shaped. <laughs> <laughs> Tony doesn't know. And we had to kind of sort of try that on L and obviously persuade her that it was all going to be all right on the day. <laughs> and all the way back to Italy and it had come back and be the head shaped. I like that this seems to be kind of the um, the undercurrent of the, the show in general. Like we had the most absurd brief. The conditions were catastrophic. <laughs> Everyone was so stressed. We weren't willing to compromise on anything and it all ended up great. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it did end up really good. I don't know, I sort of don't know how we got there actually. When I look at the photographs of the development and the, and the maker who made it, who's really fantastic and talented, but was was just like but this isn't this isn't 18th century and I was going I know I know I know what do you mean you make it kind of lower on the shoulders but that just doesn't make they never did that and I'm going oh, I know funny. that's but I know, do remember when we had the fitting remember it arrived and we fitted you I came into the fitting and we all were a bit like it was like breathtaking because I was with Francesca and we were just like the whole room was like wow it was yeah. great it, it did, and and she kind of, and she, you said, can you kneel? And, and Elle just kneeled, didn't she? she was yeah, so everyone had talked the, about it for weeks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 
don't know, it's good. Um, speaking of kind of, you know, the show is billed as a mostly untrue tale. I think the costumes certainly reflect that, um, where they have, you know, that deep, that deep history in them, but then, like I said, these kind of more contemporary kind of elements. But you mentioned, uh, or we discovered that some of the buttons on the red and oyster wardress were uh, vintage. So you did, you did use some kind of uh, materials that were kind of contemporaneous to the costumes. Yeah, I mean, That's I did actually use some um, original pieces. The elves. Uh, uh, corset, um, uh, which is kind of her pregnancy corset with the lace sides, which is pale blue and gold. That's a piece of 18th century fabric. So there are, so it's there. And um, I mean, it, it does make me laugh. Some of the detractors were saying that, um, you know, what these are, these are contemporary fabrics. They're contemporary fabrics. And I was just trying to imagine a, a, t a world where we would be able to use handmade 18th century fabrics. Exactly. <laughs> But actually, we did. We did use some pieces. We have some. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot of kind of, there are antique fabrics in there. It's just that it would be ludicrous to do a whole dress in, in something that was museum quality. Oh, but absolutely. Got, and we also copied things. We, we, got, we printed some fabrics from, so we got a sort of toile de jouet kind of patterned fabric and then we took the the, the print and we uh, used it on Elizabeth's skirts and you know there's there's it's it's all there it's running through it's just obviously mixed up in contemporary uh aesthetics sometimes uh, but I I would I am far from a detractor from the show. If anything, I would say that's kind of one of the strengths um, of kind of the costuming and the show overall. Um, it's interesting that uh, that kind of comment to me, has, it's kind of interesting that that kind of comment gets thrown around because to me, I think uh, there's like a tendency to see you know, historical figures as totally removed from our reality, but actually quite a lot of the really absurd events in the show are based on, um, yeah. on things yeah. that really happen. True. Yeah. yeah, a lot of our most absurd things, well, even we're plotting third season at the moment, we keep discovering absolutely ridiculous things that everyone will think we thought of. <laughs> but, um, yeah, often the dumbest things or the most crazy things are... Um, real things and I do think in terms of what Sharon's saying the, 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 the tension and the riff on it's sort of based then but we riff contemporarily on fabric and all those different things and the wit in Sharon's designs that's all part of the tone like all the design feeds the tone of the show I think that's why the three of you know the tone meetings are so important um, between and all the designers are in the room to, we're all together because it is all all the tone of the show from design, hair and make, all of that has to be everyone pushing in the same direction. It's sort of like if the show just rigidly did the of the time costumes, the show wouldn't be anywhere near what it is because the costumes just feed the tone with the, with the beauty and with the wit and with the slight, the riff on contemporary meets, that that's exactly what the language does. And um, so it, it, it is like such an important part tonally of the, of the show. I, I also think that hi history is, uh, you know, it's what you, what you can, you have to reinterpret it because if you dig deep enough, you can find, I don't know, dresses with prints this big and they're there. It's just that what gets left behind, you know, yeah. 300 years later is, is probably, I don't know, more of the standard stuff or people in their most formal kind of clothes have had their portraits yeah. taken. Yeah, well, that's what we always say about. People, you know. Yeah, well, what you, all you get are these incredibly well-painted portraits of people sitting nicely. I mean, no one went yeah. and got their portrait painted in their 
fucking tracksuit. You know, it's kind of like, oh, whatever the track, you know what I mean? They're, we're getting a version of the best version of these things quite often, which is the same in the, in the actual written history that you have to dig. You dig deeper and you get these weird kind of things and it isn't this perfect court that looks amazing and there's all this other stuff going on. No, and no, nobody who was pregnant got their painting done. They just didn't get yeah, it done. Exactly. Yeah. Too busy doing cocaine, I guess. <laughs> you know. No, absolutely. The, the kind of image we have of those periods is very selective, um, which uh, is kind of interesting in the characterization of Catherine as well. Um, you chose to include uh, the kind of um, fairly nasty rumor about her that was spread in the court that she had. Uh, illicit relations with a horse. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, because I'll, I think I, yeah. I wanted to just like put it out there because I was like, here's this amazing woman. And unfortunately, it's one of the main things known about her, which is one of the reasons I wanted to write the play. I was just like, it seemed very contemporary that someone's life had been reduced to a salacious headline. So who had a very complicated, amazing life, did extraordinary things and terrible things. And um, so, yeah, so yeah, we do do that, so. I think that's something I find really, uh, you kind of just mentioned how complex kind of Catherine's legacy is. And I think that's something I find really refreshing uh, about both the favorite and the great is that there are these ensemble casts of women who are just as awful as the men around them. Like they are so far, these are so far from being kind of hagiographies that, you know, just celebrate strong no. women. They're just as deranged and gross and political as anyone else. <laughs> well, yeah, I think so. I mean, everyone is, you know, I'm, I think I just write from the position and don't judge people. I never judge characters. I'm always lecturing in the writer's room about don't judge anyone. Everyone's doing what they think is right. Uh, even Peter, it all has a logic to him. Uh, and I think it's just that. I mean, Al's always funny because she's she loves, she's always like Catherine's flawed and she's got to be flawed. And we're not making Girl Boss the series, you know, we're making something else, you know, so. Absolutely. Um, did it? Do you think it had a kind of impact on Catherine's? Because Elle is on as an executive producer, I believe, yeah. on the series as well. I wonder how that, or if that, kind of impacted uh, Catherine's characterization. Uh, I think. Um, I mean, we, okay, Elle and I are very close, so I guess. I mean, it's all led by me. But I mean, I guess it does. Like, I know her really well now, and. Um, I know, you know, her, you know, she's an amazing partner in the show with me and all of us. And so I think it does. I mean, sometimes you don't know how. It's like Nick. It's like the second season of Peter and how Peter is, is in some ways a response to what an incredibly lovely person Nick is, <laughs> you know, because it's like, oh, he can, he's so sensitive and, and such a good guy um, that it felt like let's use that as a, this monster guy, monstrous guy trying to be a good guy because we know Nick is so that person. And I think, you know, you learn, the, you learn about your actors and they have strengths and you kind of, um, and I think with Al is, you know, we talk about not that much really, but I think we just really understand each other um, and that we're making the same show. And whenever we talk about Catherine, we're pretty much on the same page all the time. Um, so... But it, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not a I'm not a young woman, so her input of you know and the strength and you know that our writers' room is full of young women for that reason we do try and make a real uh, attempt. But yeah, Al, Al's amazing. Do you think? Um, I think it's quite noticeable that despite being sort of billed um, not just as a comedy but certainly as a kind of comedy drama. Uh, the two leads are not actors who I would necessarily think of primarily as comedy actors at all. They've got real kind of drama chops. I wonder kind of about how you made that decision. Uh, I think because I, well, I think I worked with Nick in rehearsal on The Favourite and I just knew, I just sort of, A, we hit it off. 
B, he was just so funny um, and so easy with it. Um, so I kind of felt like he could do Peter. I didn't, you know, um, and then Al, I just knew, even though the, the show always had a comedic, I'm always like, it's a drama with comedic execution and it had to work as a drama. And she's such a great dramatic actress. And particularly that first season had, her story had to work dramatically and emotionally for me to, for the show to work. And then I knew Nick would bring the comedy in spades and, you know, and then build an ensemble that was just effortless at both. Like all our ensemble, we spent a long time casting. There's a lot of theatre actors, a lot of actors who really understand how to put it all in truth and move what the comic truth is, what the dramatic truth is and how to move easily between. And they're all like that. And so it was sort of that. And then basically just got incredibly lucky that, Nick and Al knew each other and had worked together previously, but I don't think any of us knew their chemistry would be so incredibly great. How they are in scenes together would be so incredibly great. And as soon as I started to see that, I just started to write more and more of them as a, as a couple. Um, so, yeah, it came from there. Yeah, I think their chemistry... Um... I was just kind of reflecting on the narrative arc of season one and if their chemistry hadn't been so strong and their performances hadn't been so kind of magnetic, it would have been so sad. <laughs> like the events yeah. of season one are so tragic. Yeah. Like this poor young girl. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I think that's, yeah, I think that's true. And I think that's what you were talking about before about do I do the actors affect the show because in a way I'd never planned Peter falling in love with Catherine was uh, just an idea I had literally we shot six seven episodes and I was writing the last two or three and I was in my office and just it just I was just like you just see it they had such a connection and um, even though it was a monstrous connection you kind of made sense you know and I felt like as soon as we do this, it, it, everyone will know it's true. It's mad, but true. Um, and a lot of that was built out of their chemistry in a way. That makes sense. It does feel like kind of an organic, um, yeah, it feels very organic on screen. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you mentioned the kind of actor costumes just quickly before we kind of see if there are any questions from uh, viewers who are, who are tuning in. Um, I wonder how these kind of, uh, there are like some pretty distinct kind of visual motifs in the costuming that I noticed, um, even just like the colours, L, um, in, in season two tends to be, uh, in kind of these lighter, airy colours, occasionally with a dash of dark, but it's kind of not typically what she, um, what she's wearing, whereas um, though her costumes are significantly more kind of elaborate and ornate than um, earlier, and Peter, a more typical um, darker sort of jewel tones. I wonder how these kind of uh, these kind of visual motifs developed for you, Sharon. <clears throat> well, I think that both Holly and Emma, who um, worked before me. Um, sort of started that really so there was a certain amount of um th those kind of colors being in place I mean the Elle's sort of pale colors and her blues and and things like that but at the time um the Georgian the Georgians had a kind of uh blues a purity and clarity and you know there's certain colors mean certain things so it's kind of nice to continue using those with her I mean as she progresses and gets more mature maybe they'll change because that kept her quite while she was pregnant it kept her quite light and frothy and young and and also in contrast to Joanna coming in her mother um it's it's quite a good counterpoint and that and also Nick being dark and the sort of more hedonistic uh sort of deep exotic kind of Russian kind of colorways I think is useful. It keeps her German and him 
very much Russian at at that time in the in season two. But yeah, I was I was kind of developing what people had already started. Really, it wasn't a complete departure to do something new. It just naturally progressed. I think that makes sense. Um, I uh, it really kind of struck me in one of the I think it's a light blue and yellow pregnancy dress she's wearing almost exactly the same colors as like the first gown you ever see her in um yep. and that's what she's wearing when she's around her mother I uh, just I don't know it's very evocative you get a bit <laughs> kind of fluffier and unstructured so that she you can see how you know it's that mo mother daughter awfulness where you just become a child when you're with your mum yep <laughs> Your body, unfortunately. <laughs> it's terrifying to know that that feeling never goes away. It never goes away. No. Mm. <laughs> Mother's Day tomorrow. <laughs> um, maybe just before we take a question from the audience, um, can I ask, do you have a favourite costume? Is it the coronation gown or...? Is there mine, one? yeah. Mine, I'm. I really like uh, Joanna's arrival dress, and I really like um, uh, the sort of later pregnancy costumes. I think um, it was a, a difficult thing to think about, and I think they really work. And I, I love the freedom it it gave Elle playing Catherine that she was. They were so loose, and there's a lot I like actually, but they 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 <laughs> probably are my favourites. What about you? What about you, Tony? What's your favourite? Ah, well, the coronation, obviously, I felt like was a triumph. I love her, you know, sort of um, when her stomach's out and she's in her sort of night, night wear. I love that costume. Um, I love a lot of Elizabeth's costumes because they're yeah. so beautiful and they're so witty and they've got such beautiful detail. I really love them. I think some of them are a knockout. Um, yeah, I think they're my kind of favorite. And yeah, there's a lot of um, the lot, and some of Peter's stuff's just great because it's so rock star ish. And <laughs> you know, these big coats the coat where he's running through the forest in the truffle thing is hilarious. And um, so yeah, yeah I, I think it's like that. that. Yeah. And his massive furry hat, I love yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and the it's hat. Shock. We've, done, we've done all the fittings with it as a cardboard. You know, as a kind of you do all the fittings of the cardboard and the yeah. pulls, and I went, yeah, that's the right size. And then it, and we were all like, yeah. <laughs> and then it arrived and it was covered in fur and it was felt, felt like it was twice the size. <laughs> but too late to go back. <laughs> yeah, I think um, uh, aside from uh, the coronation dress, which is such a knockout, I think any time Peter is in a ridiculous fur hat, it's just. <laughs> perfect as far as I'm concerned. Um, we just have one question from a viewer asking uh, if there will ever be a print version of the play of the great. Uh, will um, it there is a print version. I mean, I'm sure it's out of print, but there was, you could get it for a while because um, I think Currency Press or someone may probably published it, but yeah, it was published. You could buy it for a little while there. Um, Are there any plans for a re-release? I don't know. No, no, not that I've known. Not that anyone's told me about. Um, so season three is kind of currently in development. Um, and without uh, kind of pushing you too much on what you have planned, I would love to hear from both of you what you're looking forward to uh, in the production of season three. What are you excited about? Um, I'm excited about we've got a few days off between blocks of episodes. <laughs> I'm excited about that. Um, mostly and that we get to go back to Italy. Um, what else? I think I'm just excited to be back with everybody and now we're in plotting it. Um, I'm just excited about the evolution of all the characters and using the ensemble Um even more and better in a way. Um, and just seeing the next part of Catherine and Peter's relationship. I'm just, you know, I mean, I think I'm excited just to get back and 
find what's new about the season and things that we can surprise the audience with and the look of the show and what we can do with that and just just all the fun of it really just the creative fun of making a show that has sort of made a lot of its own rules so it can keep making its own rules as it goes you know yeah that's something that uh Sharon and I were talking about before the interview as well (laughs) the idea of um the just total boundlessness of what season three could kind of possibly present where it feels like every new episode of the great just uh changes either changes the rules a little or like introduces new shiny new forms of chaos <laughs> <laughs> exactly um Sharon what about you well just read when because obviously when you read the script it's quite exciting and usually I've read the script and everybody in the room um, who's working the design team haven't read the script and when they get it you can hear peals of laughter in the other room as they kind because I already know what they're reading and, they, <laughs> and as they kind of come across things they go oh my goodness you know because there's things in the scripts that um, lend themselves visually to such exciting ideas so that's you know that's it's that's thank you Tony that's a really <laughs> good, 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 good. Rather than reading things and you're just going, oh, no, more stunts. Oh. That's funny. <laughs> you're actually reading things going, oh, God, that's fantastic. What can we do with that? Oh, that's excellent. So a lot to look forward to for production and audiences alike by the sounds of things. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Tony and Sharon, so much for your time. I think, uh, I think we'll leave it there as we're coming up on nine. But yeah, thank you so much. Really looking forward to seeing you three. Yeah. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye, Bye, Sharon. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye.